the, the reason why I said it was a very good bridge between uh, what Paul said and what I'm about to say. Um, no. I will want that. Is because the empire empire controls through divide and conquer. You can't miss it. What we're discovering now, rising with the BRICS through the leadership of China, and especially the China-Russia-India nexus, is that the new paradigm that's defining their mode of internal and foreign policy yeah. is based on an approach of a harmony of interests. Yes. Right, the idea of a win-win yeah. win situation. Exactly. And this is what's really freaking out a lot of the imperialists that have been controlling the different mechanisms of yeah. our geopolitical society for the past century. And up until now, it's largely been understood only by a few that the means by which we communicate across cultures, across languages, yeah, yeah, yeah. and get above our, our empirical, physical differences, yeah. which is cultural, you know, this person gives a light of religion, and they speak different yeah. uh, yeah. languages, they speak different, they, they work different uh, name God than I do. Yeah. We have to fight. Yeah. That's what the British have been inflamed yeah, yeah, yeah. for many, many centuries. Yeah. The reason why, the way we get over this is through the universal language. Yeah. of both science yeah. and music. Yeah, that's right. Because no matter what language you are, no matter what shape you are, you can discover that we're made of atoms. You can discover that we're in a galaxy. Yeah. And you can discover its principles and apply them to the benefit of your people if you're being creative. If you're not following any formulas that tell you you have to think this way and you can't break out of those formulas, if you don't believe that, and you, you're wise enough to know, know your material, but you have the creative spirit enough to think outside the box, you can discover laws of the universe and translate that back in ways that are both beautiful, that have expression in arts, have expression in science, and that's the technological improvement that allows us to have 7 million people on Earth. And the oligarchy has been doing a lot of propaganda as we went through to get people to believe that the fact that we have 7 billion people on the Earth that can live much longer than we could have 3,000, 4,000 years ago in general, that's a sign that we're a virus. Most people would say, oh yeah, of course there's 7 billion people on the Earth. That's a sign of a virus. Don't you know that? No. What, the, what they're missing is that there's a that is a shadow of a principle. The principle is not something you can see because that is the driver of what defines us as a human and not a monkey. Physically, we're not that different. The DNA wise is not that different. If you're going to try to make a materialist case for why we're different than animals, you won't go very far. Right? We got a bigger prefrontal cortex, so we can lie better. Right? <laughs> we play better video games because we have multiple thumbs. <laughs> But if you, if you get beyond that to a deeper species characteristic that we are able to, to discover how we think and think better about th after having discovered that one assumption that we had was wrong and replace it with a better hypothesis that allows us to resolve paradoxes and translate that back to doing good for ourselves and our fellow man and find happiness in that process. If you can define human beings as that, the oligarchy, no oligarchy, whether it's Asian or European or whatever its, it's flavor, will ever be able to seek its, its tentacles into human society. And the fact that Paul brought up the question of culture, and, and well, he brought up the, the, this very important personality who you guys all have some, some disgusting literature in front of you named Bertrand Russell. And I'm assuming before people got here, did they already have an idea of who Bertrand Russell was? So-so? Yeah? Okay. Mr. LaRouche, uh, the gentleman we worked with, uh, was a 93-year-old physical economist, uh, a candidate for the presidency of the American uh, Republic on eight occasions, and an advisor to international governments, has made the point on a number of occasions, which people find very troubling, that Bertrand Russell is the most e qualifies as being the most evil man of the 20th century, which is controversial, because as Paul went through, this is the, this is the big peacemaker. He, he won the Nobel Prize for literature. He's, uh, he's the guy who fought the, throughout the 60s to create the anti-nuclear movement, right? To, to ban the bomb and all of these things. <coughs> so how the hell is a guy who's apparently a logician? For literature, do you know the book? It was a special book for the entire activity. I'll get back to you on that one. Um, he did write prolif prolifically. But Bertrand Russell's ghost doesn't just infest our society in the form of a fear of, of thermonuclear annihilation, being it that he was one of the co-architects of the mutually assured destruction doctrine. It goes deeper than that as well. That's one important aspect. And I'm going to touch in my presentation on, on another aspect. And I'm going to do it in a way that uh, utilizes the writings of a certain scientist and a philosopher and a musician 
named Max Planck. Um, before I do that, though, I, I want to start with a quick anecdote because, and this, this is going to get at how the ghost of Bertrand Russell's mind still infects and controls and distorts our society today. We, Christine and myself were at a little while ago at a, a conference uh, called Africa 2063. It's one of these conferences in Ottawa held by uh, the public service, or you know, some the government of Canada. On what should Africa do to stop being so bad, right? And you go to this thing and. There, there, there's certainly a few African diplomats there, but generally the whole thing is controlled by a bunch of detached white bureaucrats <laughs> talking as experts about what Africa should do to be more behaved. Ask me, I will let you know, because soon I'm going to run for president. Let that okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the, here's the thing. What they started doing is they started pulling up a bunch of statistical graphs and stats and index charts pointing out. First they had a, a corruption index chart of the world going through all of the most corrupt na nations. Of course, you know, Africa, all the, Russia, China, very corrupt on the index chart of corruption. Uh, Canada, number one, not corrupt, 100% no corruption, right? Uh, great Britain, no corruption. <laughs> and of course, they're, they're giving this, these charts as a way to somehow just, they're mathematical, entirely mathematical, right? As if you could ma measure corruption or inequality by a mathematical metric, as if that were possible, but they do it anyway. And then they use that as a way to morally say, this is why we can tell them how much carbon they have to reduce, how much they have to obey to international standards of good governance. Now, I don't know if they've ever looked at what exactly Harper does in the, in the back rooms or what the Privy Council is in Canada, but I think that would change their charts a little bit. Um, one of the, one of the uh, a professor gets up afterwards who's from Nigeria, and he begins his presentation by, by saying, I'm going to be declaring war on mathematics. <laughs> He's not saying he is mathematics. He's saying he gives an anecdote of one of his uh, uh, invitations to participate in a World Bank summit meeting, or a World Bank meeting on <coughs> African culture. He was supposed to be a representative on, to speak as an authority on African culture. And he said, as, as soon as I got there, I saw a bunch of IMF, World Bank economists, um, <laughs> um, all sitting together talking about Africa, and I knew it was going to be bad news. And they start pulling up their charts, and they start making an excuse, or making arguments, very mathematical, logical arguments, that Africa is doing really great. Its business is up, the markets are up, they're, you know, and they're, they're, if you would just look at the map, you'd think, well, there must be a, a renaissance. Things are so monetarily good based on the data sets that they're presenting. And, um, and it got me thinking in, in a discussion with him afterwards, you know, we were playing with this irony that in our society, we pride, our, pride ourselves in the West of having produced more PhDs per capita than in any other moment in our, in our past. And yet, with all of those PhDs being pumped out of our society, out of our universities, the collapse of our civilization is happening at a faster and faster rate. Paradox. If the purpose of education is supposed to equip people with the mental capacities to solve problems, why the hell are we only making problems worse and worse? And it seems good people, who seem to be, you know, they kiss their child, uh, bad night, they read them stories, they are a good neighbor, good father, good mother. <clears throat> Yet these people, as soon as they become PhDs and work for the World Bank, work as economists in most of the institutions, they seem to have a complete disconnect that the theories, the ivory tower formulas that they apply, kill millions, if not billions of people. There's a total disconnect between the theory, this abstract system of formula, and reality. There is generally not a very good connection. How is that the case? What are we doing wrong? And this is where the question of Bertrand Russell becomes very interesting from another angle. Because yes, as, I, as Paul as I recapitulated, mutually assured destruction, society of fear, <coughs> divide to conquer, a balance of powers, that's been the last 60, 70 years, right? A total balance of terror from the Soviets, from the, the Americans, the capitalists, the you know, you, you had the, 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 the capitalist liberal extreme on the one side that was supposed to define one extreme in polarity, versus the totalitarian Soviet regime states of the world. And that balance of terror was the defining thing. <clears throat> now, Lyndon LaRouche makes a point, and this is going to get at Bertrand Russell, that in order to figure out how he was able to make his long-term forecast successfully over the past four decades is because he rejected mathematical, statistical approaches to economic analysis. His first step, and he's been trying to say this to everybody, he's saying it's not just me who want, I don't have special powers, I just use common sense and recognize that these are not reliable metrics of value when you're charting economic health, 
or the future of a system. You can't use mathematical, statistical methods of analysis. You can't do that. And he said, because I rejected that, I was free to start looking for what are more uh, valid physical scientific parameters defining the boundary conditions of the system, which we are, as of 7 billion you know, of our species on the Earth, we are a system. What are the physical parameters defining our potential to reproduce ourselves as a species successfully into the future? Right? Are we producing more food? Okay, if so, then the increase of money supply in the system is probably justified. If you're finding that your food production and the means of production as a whole are actually being reduced over time per capita, while at some, <clears throat> by some miracle your monetary abundance is increasing, you're doing something wrong. Right? If the physical means that you have to produce enough to sustain, and a little bit more, your system, your society, if that is being destroyed by any logical argument, while your monetary flows are increasing, you're not, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, you could smell it a lot. But you could only smell it if you got a, an internal metric standard of value. And that's the thing, it's not a question of some logical argument beating up some other logical argument. It's a question, do you have an internal moral standard of value that you use to govern your analysis that will allow you an insight into knowing where is society going to break down, where is the destruction happening, where, is the, where are the wars coming at us, and how do you change that? How do you intervene through an act of will in <coughs> mind to change those parameters, right? If you don't see that, if you, if you are just looking at the future in any other way, by just extrapolating what, what came yesterday, what came the, the day before yesterday, okay, well, there was no collapse yesterday, there's no collapse last week, there's no collapse last month, I guess if I just continue to linearly extrapolate that into my idea, my abstract idea of what the future is, sure, there won't be a collapse. And I can talk about what is the world going to be like in 40 years. I, you know, it's going to be just a slow, little bit, you know, worse version of what we have today. That's, it's a slow, gradual, like, bleh. You know, maybe at some point, the machines will fight us at some point. You know? But you, people, people's idea of the future is really fucked up. Because they don't have this scientific idea of value. And this is what Lebrush has been saying for a long time, since he started this organization, that people really need to think more deeply about the meaning of science. And I'm not going to go into any uh, serious detail, I'm not going to try to resolve any, any problems about the quantum or anything when I'm bringing up Max Planck. I'm just going to be introducing Max Planck's uh, method of thinking, some of the warnings that he had laid out for present scientists and future ones in his day, but to begin with a quick uh, Stephen by the roof from a paper of last year called Mind Over Your Matter. Very fun paper. He writes, Kevin Munderman, yeah. Science must be reconsidered as being, in principle, the yet to be discovered of the hitherto unknown advances into the domain of the higher principles of knowable truth. As great talents such as Bernard Riemann, Max Planck, and Albert Einstein appreciate his principle of science prior to the trend. Kravitsky is unleashed since the outburst of the celebration of the advent of the 20th century, such as the moral and pseudo-scientific travesties typified by the advent of such monsters as Bertrand Russell. Strong words. <coughs> so, one of the elements that LaRouche has been putting forth for decades is that we need to study the original writings of people who made discoveries. Don't necessarily dwell on encyclopedia entries or people who act like they know about things and write about and interpret what some, some real scientific discoverer made as a discovery, just go straight to the source. Just get a sense of how they're actually thinking. They're going to tell you how they're thinking. And you're going to find that in doing so, you're going to find that most of the expert opinion about most scientific discoveries that are, are believed in our society are actually bullshit. Whether knowingly or whether, as we're going to discover, uh, or whether unknowingly or whether knowingly, uh, that would be the case. And Bertrand Russell will play a very big role in this is LaRouche made a point of calling him uh, a pseudoscientific travesty <laughs> and a monster for reasons that are more than just political, directly political in nature. Now, Bertrand Russell, uh, on top of his disgusting political views on how the society should organize itself, and that was put into practice, working through uh, the leading governing circles of the Fabian Society, the highest governing faculties of Cambridge, Russell produced several works on how society needs to be organized to have a balance and a harmony under a good, healthy, oligarchical system, where people just didn't really get too uppity. 
One of these books is called Impact of Science in Society in 1951, where Bertrand Russell, and this is one of a number of, it's very difficult to quote Bertrand Russell when you want to get across how sick this guy is, because almost every page has something sicker than the page before. <laughs> this one is, I think, very though, indicative of the type of thinking that shapes our current society, where he writes, the subject will make great strides when it is taken up by scientists under a scientific dictatorship. The social psychologists of the future will have a number of classes of school children on whom they will try different methods of producing an unshakable conviction that snow is black. Various results will soon be arrived at. First, that the influence of home is obstructive. Second, that not much can be done unless the indoctrination begins before the age of ten. Third, that verses set to music and repeatedly intoned are very effective. Fourth, that the opinion that snow is white must be held to show a morbid taste for its centricity. But I anticipate. It is for future scientists to make these maxims precise and discover exactly how much it costs per head to make children believe that snow is black, and how much less it would cost to make them believe it is dark gray. Got a bit of a sick sense of humor there. 20 years earlier, he wrote another book on the science of society, where he got this in another fashion. It was so bawling that I had to just read this. Uh, the scientific rulers will provide one kind of education for ordinary men and women, and another for those who are to become holders of scientific power. This is 1930. Ordinary men and women will be expected to be docile, industrious, punctual, thoughtless, and contented. Of these qualities, probably contentment will be considered the most important. In order to produce it, all the researches of psychoanalysis, behaviorism, and biochemistry will be brought into play. All boys and girls will learn from an early age to be what is called cooperative, i.e., to do exactly what everybody else is doing. Popular opinion. Initiative will be discouraged from these children, and insubordination, without being punished, will be scientifically trained out of them. Except for the one matter of loyalty to the world state and to their own order, members of the governing class will be encouraged to be adventurous and full of initiative. It will be recognized that it is their business to improve scientific technique and to keep the manual workers contented by means of continual new amusements. Wow. wow. Sorry, Matt. Yeah. Do you remember what book this is from? I will give you that. There's a PDF of that. that I can send you. Um, <coughs> so the question is, how do you get society to fall for that? When you're in a world, this is 19, you know, 30 a year, you're still at a, at, a, at a moment where you have great scientists who had made a, a giant scientific revolution throughout the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s. People like Max Planck, Einstein, the Curie uh, family, the daughter, the son-in-law. But, but you had a whole culture of scientific optimism that had been given new breath and new life based on the, the discoveries and the density of new principles that were discovered in the end of the 19th century and to the beginning of this period. So people were still in a state where they weren't, they weren't of the view like they are today that, that scientific and technological progress is just bad. It's just intrinsically us changing nature for the worse and thus killing nature as a virus that we are. They didn't believe that then. That was not the, the general governing ethic. So how would you get people who actually don't believe that society should be, that truth should be only allowed for a small clique, right, to control scientific power um, under conditions? To, to allow for a, a, a template like that to be put into action. So this is where I mentioned you, you know, Nobel Prize. Uh, History of Western Philosophy. So two, two of the most influential books, there are a few others that Bertrand Russell himself wrote, uh, involved part of what, it, what gets at the essence of how this operation works. He basically they rewrote Western civilization <laughs> on the one hand in a way, in, with an angle that would allow for the justification uh, for an imperial system, on one. This is literally read as a mandatory reading in every philosophy <coughs> program in the Western world. The thing also, it's also in Asia, as it has penetrated too. Uh, this is one of the, literally, when I say the most widely read philosophy book, that's it, where he just redefines all of the Western thinkers from Plato all the way to the present, uh, defining Removing something very important from the mix, <laughs> without which that ingredient you would not understand how the hell do you beat an oligarchy? How do you join the bricks? Right? If you don't have this understanding of what 
govern the real creative leaps in, of, of our understanding of the nature of the universe and its application to political freedom for the past several thousand years, and since the time of, of Solon of Athens and before, if you don't have that understanding of what Plato did and what the Renaissance was all about, and you, you believe what Bertrand Russell writes about logic, that everything is about yes, right and wrong, yes or no, this binary, that's, that's Western civilization, it's right and wrong, black and white. So we obviously have to get out of that idea. If you believe that, you will not understand how we should join the BRICS. You will not understand what the principle of the BRICS is, which is a revival of something which America was based upon, and Americans themselves don't even know this. It's something that Canadians also have to realize because we failed to take advantage of this opportunity in our historical traditions when it was presented to us to join up and become an independent nation. We failed on various occasions. That's an important part of our history. If you read Bertrand Russell, you won't know that. The second thing, book was written before. You guys heard about the Principia Mathematica? Yeah? So, this is 1910? <coughs> Principia Mathematica was produced? Yeah. So, what he's doing with this is reducing all of knowledge to a state where we can define truth as mathematical certainty. That unless you can describe math with mathematical certainty a process, where both sides of the equation balance out. If you can't do that, you don't know truth. Truth is not it. Truth is only with, by reducing any physical process that you can observe to some state of math. Another aspect of this was saying that because you can, you can use a reductionist way to break things apart, let's say you're looking at a, at a bird, you want to figure out what makes life, what makes the bird tick, Reductionism, which is what Bertrand Russell is basically advocating, is that you have to see the birds as sum of parts, and if you want to get at what, what makes it tick, you got to start breaking it apart. Because the parts, you know, the, these little parts make up the cells, make up the bird. So what makes the cells move? Well, get down there, start pulling them apart. And at a certain point, you start plucking the bird apart, and you've forgotten that you've killed the bird. You actually don't know what makes it tick. So the idea that the sum, that the whole is simply the sum of its parts, is a fundamental aspect of what Bertrand Russell was trying to advocate as being the way that we have to think scientifically. And based on that, we can start you know, creating deductive and inductive reasoning that would allow us to evaluate what a system is. Right. You guys heard of deductive, inductive? Two choices, right? Two paths to truth. You can either start with the parts, look for, look for patterns, or the sun, the sun rays yesterday, the sun rays the day before, thus the sun rays forever on 24 hour cycles, right? You get in, you take some, some experience and you make it universal out of it. Or you can do something by, by starting from an assumption that, pick an assumption, you know, uh, all people are, are monkeys, okay? The world is full of people, and thus the world is full of monkeys. Or the idea that, better yet, you a better way of saying that? People are monkeys, monkeys have no ability to have more than 20 million of their species, Thus, there's 7 billion people, so we should only have 20 million of our species. Right? That, that's the, the type of very naive reasoning where you start with the universal rule, and then you try to find that, okay, there's some specificities, and I'm going to try to figure out their, their nature by looking at the, the rule that I set up. It was like three logical fallacies in one. <laughs> and yet, that's the type of thing you get when you try to get into a world bank economist. <laughs> Greece has to pay their debt. Yeah, but they're going to die to pay their debt. Yeah, but their debt has to be paid. Yeah, but they must yeah, die because of the virus. <laughs> 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 the, the debt is sacred, life is not. So, what you're, what you're lacking here is a sense of, of just basic, there's something that you're missing. Point is, there's not just two paths to, to knowledge. And this is what we're getting at, this is what Max Planck will be getting at. And the consequence of thinking in these terms, of, of trying to find everything with absolute mathematical certainty, will result in a, a conclusion that there is no, no causality. That causality itself is naive. When Bertrand Russell made his life's work, basically trying to get, refute the idea of cause by first defining what science is. And by misdefining it, he was able to say, well, thus there is no cause. Where he literally wrote, and this is in you know, 1912, to me it seems that philosophy ought not to assume such legislative functions, and that the reason why physics has ceased to look for causes is that, in fact, there are no such things. The law of causality, I believe, like much that passes muster among philosophers, is a relic of a bygone age, surviving only because it is erroneously supposed to do no harm. <laughs> now, think about this, right? What, in whose advantage would it be for society to think this way? 
Because who's putting into motion, who's, who's causing the political process that people are living in to change in a way which is destroying their own ability to survive and perpetuate their species through the use of the nuclear bomb in certain <coughs> game theory ways? Who is putting this process into motion? Who's causing the process to come into being that's creating a, a culture of fear, of paranoia? The same people are trying to tell you there's no cause. <laughs> oh yeah, of course the arsonists will tell you there's no there's no play lighting fires. <laughs> Ignore those fires. It's okay. <laughs> so <sighs> the irony of what Russell is doing, and he's speaking to the indeterminist, the school, the new school that had just really started flourishing of the people who rejected the, the naive classical mechanistic view of, of causality. They, they, they rejected that. They were that smart to say, okay, well, the idea that mechanical formulas absolutely determine creation, that's wrong. Okay, so they, but rather than trying to find, well, what non-mechanistic approach to looking at what's shaping the universe that we observe, rather than looking for a more, a better version of it, or a better approach to it, they simply became indeterminist. They stopped believing in any form of determination, of any form of causation, and that's what Bertrand Russell is speaking to. This is ironic because in this period of 1912, <clears throat> again, you're, you're having the blossoming of a whole new epoch in human knowledge. The, all of the former boundary conditions of what our idea of what's the smallest we can go, what's the, what's the universe of, of, that we can relate to, conceptually and, and also physically, that had completely those boundary conditions had completely been blown apart, both in the small, right? When Max Planck came out with his discovery of a certain type of, of that energy has a certain quantized uh, state to it, that when you go down to the very small, there's a certain limit to, well, basically how small you can, can, can break things down on a certain level. So light both has a certain wave-like quality, it has a certain uh, particle-like uh, energy, it also has a certain quality of an energy packet. It's not just purely a, a, an energetic wave. So we discovered that there was this, this certain boundary condition on the small that gave us a new ability to do experimental physics and make more discoveries. But on the large, his friend and, and fellow musician, uh, not a coincidence, Albert Einstein, was setting whole new boundary conditions for what exactly, what, what are new constants that would allow us to evaluate the process that we could observe of the universe. So this, these, these were things that were completely overthrowing former dogmas that were held as sacred cows, the idea of absolute space, the, the action at a distance of Newton, the idea that you had uh, Euclidean space, of just you know, X, Y, Z charts, that, and that you have these, these parallel lines going forever as parallel lines into infinity. All of these things were overthrown with these discoveries. And the idea that matter as, as a whole actually had contained within it more energy potential than anything known hitherto. These were, these were overthrowing everything that Bertrand Russell was saying we had to deduce all of knowledge into a set of axioms and a set of, you know, that's basically the idea of, of trying to reduce everything to formulas is you have to reduce everything to a set of logical propositions that everyone believes are true. Who is the show you can think of? He, he comes in a bit later as a buddy of, of Einstein and demonstrates that I didn't read his proof because I'm not a mathematician. But, but he basically comes in and demonstrates that there's a fallacy in uh, Bertrand Russell's Principia by, de by demonstrating something to the effect of uh, that, that it only works in describing objective processes. Anything that doesn't actually refer to itself, it's consistent, but as soon as it refers to itself effectively, it breaks down. <laughs> and I mean, Dr. Sink could probably say a lot more than that about, than I can. My, my question is, yeah. how can Russia Bertrand Russell was? How intervention? How intervention was it? Basically, okay. while he was producing that book, okay. quantum mechanics was developing. Yeah. Special relativity and general relativity was developing. And yeah. really, you were going completely against these ideas. I know. Yeah. Quantum mechanics is no determination of quantum no, mechanics. Yeah, Everything sure. is probability. Yeah. While Einstein used the, the causality to prove that uh, the speed of light has to be constant. Yeah. It's basically because of the causality that the speed of light has to be constant, nothing else, although it was proven experimentally at the yeah. time. But the idea Einstein came up with, with it because of it, again, it's causality that, uh, that uh, light cannot move faster than that particular speed. 
So he did all his ideas, never really influenced anyone. Well, you're going to find that when you go into the school of cybernetics, systems analysis, even the Copenhagen school, people mm -hmm. like Niels Bohr, were highly influenced by the Russell directly, uh, Norbert Wiener, John von Neumann, the, uh, the game theoreticians, the Morgenstern. All these folks were deeply, deeply influenced directly by Russell's work because what they were, re what they were refuting in terms of classical mechanics was the Russian interpretation. They were not actually dealing with what Einstein, I'm, I'm, what I'm going to read with from, not from Einstein, from Max Planck's writings, what I'm going to read is going to demonstrate a little bit about what Einstein, or what Einstein and Planck were actually doing with their sense of what knowledge and causality was, which is different from what Russell said it was. That, I don't want that to sound too esoteric right now, but it's going to make more sense as we read some Planck. Can I, can I just say, uh, yeah. you started at UBC, and, and there's like part of the philosophy program, you have to take uh, some kind of geologic yeah, and, and, and look, Russell himself never believed what he said was true. It's like Adam Smith. He didn't himself believe in his own doctrines. It was that he, Adam Smith worked for the British East India Company and had to produce, produce a treatise to justify bringing America back under the fold of the, the mother. And that was based on, again, these guys don't necessarily believe what they're saying. That's always it when you get to the higher echelons of those who are engaged in pr producing theoretical works to justify empire. I think that was also in the infancy when uh, his writings were really getting going. Now you're seeing the results of it. Uh, Russell's. Right. Uh, at the time when you know, general relativity and theory of relativity, like Einstein's work was a lot more popular, and him and his class of thinkers were obviously a lot more free to espouse yeah. their ideas and not face much opposition. Now it's kind of like the Green Movement. The Green Movement started out in infancy with not much power. Now they've completely co opted all the environmental movements and they've Turn them upside down. And That's side Russell. Out. See, this is Russell. That's Russell, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah, well, it's but a, I want to get on with the. This is your own view of the Yeah. Uh, isn't the adjoining uh, sort of rehabilitation in part because of quantum information theory now that we recognize? Let's bring that up in the discussion afterwards because I don't want to go too off topic from the, the line of investigation that we're on right now, but we can revisit some of that. Um, and Dr. Hussein, I think, probably contribute more to that part of the discussion than I can. <laughs> but, uh, one of the aspects that was coming through here was that, you know, uh, as part of the classical system, you had to be able to always measure whether it was a planet or something in motion, both its position and its velocity. And the fact that when you got into the quantum world and you started looking at electrons or you started looking at photons, you couldn't do it anymore, right? And we all know the story. As soon as you, as soon as you try to get down enough to, uh, into, uh, as soon as you try to observe a photon or an electron in motion, if you want greater definition of where its position is, then you got to use a smaller wavelength, which causes it to move more than if you had less definition of where it was. You use a wider wavelength, and you have a less idea. But the point is, as soon as you, you observe it, it gets hit by a light or like a light wave, and has to jump back to your field of perception. And then you can make a judgment of where it is. As soon as you do that, you move it, you change it. So you can't. That doesn't happen with a planet. You see a planet, light wave hit the, hits the planet, it comes back to you. You chart where where it is. All is well and good about its velocity and position. It doesn't work on the small. So, while you had the statistical mechanists saying, or the, the new statisticians, the indeterminists saying, that's a proof that there is no causality. You just, there's no, you can't, because you can't get all of the facts in, with mathematical certainty, there's no causality. You can only get, at best, maybe some probability and try to refine probability. Max Planck and, and, and Einstein are treated like crazy old quacks today. <laughs> you guys know that these guys are, are the ones who didn't get the new the new doctrine. They just, they just were holding on to the old theory that there was causality, and that's why they were coops, not respected by the real scientific community in their age. No, I'm sorry. Um, in Europe, Max, Max Planck is a god to physicians. I don't know what they are saying. You know? Well, this is something I was told a lot, and I've had a lot of other people to, who have experienced this, too, that they're, I don't know, if, has anyone heard this, that Einstein was an old, a crazy quack who couldn't accept the new paradigm? I don't know about this is the first time that, I, that I'm Max saying Planck this is the father of New theories, so he is the basic. In he was at war the whole time, though, with the new breed of, of statisticians to try to get them to realize there's something that they're that they're missing out on. Isn't that where the famous quote Einstein says is? Um, I was a good guy, I suppose. Yeah, that's that's one aspect of it. It, it was string theory that came immediately after. That came much later. But it, okay, yeah. but it challenged Einstein. I don't know if that's part of it. Though. That's. 
As far as I've understood, that seems to be based on a really bad interpretation of uh, physics. As far as I understand, I don't know, there might be something legitimate there, but in terms of what Einstein and Planck and Kepler before them were doing, it seems like there is something that, that's missing. Um, Planck fights back, and I'm going to try to run through this relatively quickly because this, this I know is a meaty topic, but it's important. It's important because we are at a paradigm shift in human civilization, and we should be able to get a little bit deeper past the surface of things to see what's behind the ideas shaping our world and our future. So it's worth the time. I'm using most of the, the, the writings. There's about six small quotes uh, taken from the Philosophy of Physics by Max Planck in 1938, and another work that he wrote called The Universe in the Light of Modern Physics, um, which I highly recommend reading. They're both very, very readable uh, essays. <clears throat> but he makes the, Max Planck makes the point that the reason why the measurements of atomic physics are inexact need not necessarily be looked for in any failure of causality. It may equally well consist in the formulation of faulty concepts, and hence of inappropriate questions. Okay? So you're saying maybe our concepts and the questions that we're posing are more the problem. It's maybe not causality which is the problem. There might be something else about how we're looking at it. So how does he do that? What does he mean? He gives an example. A quick example. Um, somebody want to read? No, go ahead. We're swapping around. You continue. You're a good reader. Okay. So let us take two numbers which are practically equal in magnitude. This is Max Planck. One of them being the square root of two, and the other 1.4142. One blah blah blah. The former figure is a few billions greater than the latter, and in every numerical calculation in physics or in astronomy, the two numbers can be treated as identical. So they're the same thing, right? Square root of two. Give more. Well, okay. I I could speculate, but uh, I'm not sure who I'm going to Sure. Uh, basically, the way me and my friends regard causality is that it's an emergent property from the unit membrane of the universe. As you get quantum fluctuations that will allow, not just the board, but the coalescing effect, you get catalysts that are, that are, sorry, that are holographic projections of the underlying strata of the planet. And we can have a discussion about that, but for the time being, stick on like his, his line of thinking. Um, do, do we see sort of what he's trying to get at between how are they different, square root of two, and uh, 1.14123562? To uh, how are these? Though they are, they work the same practically in this observational astronomy or physics. He says that they're different. Do you guys see how he means? Now, well, one of the I guess the former is the principle. It's a it's more conceptual. So square root two. The square root two. The other one is just one way of looking at what the square root of two could mean if you're measuring it up to a certain number. So how do you represent the square root of two, if not by simply a number symbol? How do you represent it physically, or as you were saying, it's principle? So what, what is it? How would you represent that? Well, how would I, as opposed to one point one four one two, you mean? Yeah, symbol. Right? As, rather than simple, these are both symbols in a sense. This is symbolic language, that's a symbol. But what, what would be the physical process that would... He says origin. One is classed as the origin, and the other is simply magnitude. Would you be able to discover this no. if you didn't first have an idea of something of a quality first? Where does that, right? Would this number ever come about if we'll there wasn't some first it. idea? No, wait, what would come first? This would come first, right? Yeah. What is that? What is that a symbol of? Or what is that a, a, a shadow of? What's happening physically when you see a square root two? What do you say? Well, it's a square. It's a square. It's, it's a square. square. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Not a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a square. <laughs> and it's a square. Was an area of what? <laughs> two. Two. Right. Okay. So you you can get that. You can actually prove that by taking a square of one and figuring out doubling how you double that square of one. What do you do to the square to get a square of two from the square of one? How do you double that? Take the diagonal. Take a diagonal, right? So you take a diagonal. You can then prove through simply acts of reason that this diagonal, this second square, is exactly, exactly double your first square in area, right? You can prove that. Can you all prove that? Make sense? Okay. If you want to, you just say, okay, one, two, three, one half, one half, one half, one half. Okay, that's two. That's that's an area of two 
relative to my first of one, right? Well, what's the, the, side, the side of one is one. One times one is one. What's the side of what times what equals two? Right? But you can't do it that way. <laughs> I would not be able to ever come up with that number and figure out, okay, it, that number times itself gives me two. Because I'm never going to have an end to that number. So that number only exists as an idea for us because somebody had to discover that there was something as a process within the quality of the square, which existed with or without human beings, there was squares. That's something like, like you know, there's, there's hexagons in, in the form of snow. It doesn't mean that humans make hexagons. We use them all, all sorts of ways, but we didn't, it's not because of us that they're there. They're already there. <laughs> but there's a certain discoverable aspect of nature that we have to look at, and then we can find that there's two ways of expressing it. One is a shadow, and one is closer to the cause. Yeah? Actually, the, the one point one for one yeah. is an approximation. It's an approximation. Of the, of the square root of two. That's all, yeah. Because if you take one point four one and multiply it by itself, yeah. you will not get two. No. You no. are not going to get two unless you have really much it's larger number. It's purgatory. Well, it's purgatory. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's never will yeah. get it's it's exactly two. 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 Yeah. 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 And so just yeah. stop with numbers at some point. You'll have trillions and trillions of decimal How much bailout do we need before the bats are back and back and again? A little bit more bailout. No, a little bit less bailout. A little bit less, right? It's, it's, it's insane. It yeah. drives you crazy. But doesn't yeah. that apply to the concept of numbers? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a tool, but it's, it's just that. It's, we invented it, we can use it, but we shouldn't start worshipping it, right? It's, it's, it's like money. You should, you, it's a tool, we invented it, we can use it better than carrying you know, chickens on our back, but we shouldn't worship it. It has its place. That's not the, the value comes from something qualitative, right? And if you continue that process, you start getting, if you actually start continuing that process of action, you can start getting that we're actually dealing with an introduction to basic logarithms, right? Where you have a certain type of arithmetical growth happening while you have a geometrical growth happening at the same time, right? It's a, it's a basic, you know, discovery that little kindergarten kids should be playing with in a fun way and getting a sense that they shouldn't be worshiping numbers. Now, Bertrand Russell's educational reforms don't allow that. <laughs> and it could, By the way, the new math is derivative from Bertrand Russell. The new math is derivative, there you go. That was what, 1960s or? Uh, yeah, the new, I noticed that, <laughs> Julie. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so, here's, here's what gets us at um, the next point that he's going to make. And to bridge that point with the next point that Russell, that Russell, that Plunk makes, for me, Plunk, um, <laughs> is that if you you're dealing now with a quality, it's a, a square, right? You could take your square and you can divide it in two, right? So I can divide it in two. I can divide it that way or I can divide it the way I just did, that way. The point is, I take my square, I can divide it, and I get like two things, two rectangles or two triangles, whatever. But I can divide it in two. However, the idea of square as an idea, can you divide that into two? As an idea. I don't mean the square itself. Physically, the physical expression of the square you can divide. You mean is it the person? You mean is it the person? I can keep actually just break up the idea. Uh, like equality, right? Like you know, equality is necessary for me as an idea to shape this and judge that two of the sides that I just created are equal. If I didn't have the idea of equality, I couldn't judge that those two sides were equal, could I? But could I break the idea of equality up into two? Mm, kind of an absurd question. It's sort of like a, it's a weird question. Can I, can I, can we have your justice, right? How much does this taste? <laughs> you know, like it's one of these, it's a wrong question. Yeah. Because what, what Plant is saying about there, there exists a category of wrong questions, mm -hmm. uh, false concepts, in, in, inappropriate questions. What's the color of a painting that's smaller than the wavelength of uh, color? Hey, <laughs> bad question. <laughs> Um, that's not me, that's Plunk who used that example. Um, okay, so Plunk gets at how the next point he makes in his essay that modern physics has taught us that the nature of any system cannot be discovered by dividing it into its component parts and studying each part by itself. We must keep our attention on the whole and on the interconnections between the parts. <laughs> You can't assume a society is made up of a whole seven billion hedonistic monkeys who just want pleasure and want to avoid pain and with a hedonistic calculus, and that's called free markets. You can't just assume the whole is the sum of its, of its impulses. It's the error of modern medicine. 
who says, uh, make an X-ray of, uh, I don't know, a part, mm -hmm. and uh, we know what's your problem. Right. Actually, yeah. it's a system, and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes something went over your head is like causing a thing in your foot. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that, that, that common sense, right? You, I couldn't say that, oh, uh, my adding up your, the, all of the, you are the sum total of all of your, your facial characteristics. And I somehow just have this like logic machine in my head that just adds them all up and, and equates their like distances from each other and, and finds that you're not Robbie and you're you. <laughs> no, like you're you. I, I, I recognize you first. And babies do that too. Uh, they recognize their mom through voice, vocal holes, right, they got an identity, uh, visual, and, uh, and this is what, what Planck is saying, we, we have to hold that in mind, that our mind has that quality of needing to find a hole to make sense of a part. You can't just try to build something up from parts, and you can't just try to reduce the hole to parts and assume that you know what the hole is. You gotta look beyond that. And this gets at the, um, it's a rut of identity, this gets to the next question, since he says, in dealing with the with the structure of any science, a reciprocal interconnection between epistemological judgments and judgments of value was found to arise, and that no science can be wholly disentangled from the personality of the scientist. That's controversial. What do you guys think he's saying that? Observer and object. Hmm? Observer and object. The observer sees what their mind preconditions them to see. You can't pretend that there's some absolute schism between the actual scientist who's investigating something and the discovery that he makes. You can't just pretend that there's this infinite wall of divide. Because this is what pisses people off today. Like a lot of people get very uncomfortable with that because they're saying, no, no, no. They, what they're saying is, no, that's your, your emotions, your, your, the pollution of your personal uh, desires, tastes, all of your personal shit inside of you. That's, that's, pollu that's polluting the objective criteria of pure, certain, tr mathematical truth that's outside of us perpetually. There's no relationship. This is chaos inside. That's order. That's, there's, there's no, no, you can't do that. Planck is saying, no, I, you can't, yeah, not only you, can you do it, but you gotta do it, because if you don't do it, you, you, you miss the point of science. Because the, the philosophy of the scientist is going to affect how he reads and evaluates his data, how he comes to his discoveries. But his discoveries are inevitably going to feed back on his philosophy, right? You can't, you can't jump, you, you can't escape the, that that fact that as soon as you discover something, it's obviously going to feed back on your general philosophy of life, your epistemological base, and your values probably too, right? You're probably going to have a more refined insight, a more refined ability to judge certain qualities that you wouldn't have had if you were ignorant of the thing that you were searching. So yeah, it's just a, there there are not we're not always in a state where the whole universe is alive in our minds, necessarily. Sometimes you're, you're you know, watching TV, you're watching a ball game. <laughs> it's not necessarily going to be the case that that's the intersection of the objective reality and your internal one. But there are places where this does intersect, and that's the point that science, real scientists have to keep in mind, and not pretend that there is something that's absolutely out of them that's separate from them. Yeah. But this is actually a, a good thing, right? I mean, oh, yeah. uh, our modern culture tells us that it's bad be subjective as though subjective means hidden in our brains away from the real world. I mean, it's our interests and in, in our human behavior that discovers the true properties of things in human use. Yeah, that's also because they've misdefined both subjectivity and objectivity. Yeah, they've misdefined and mystified at the same time. Because yeah. uh, this, this is where, you know, you get the flaky, oh, I create my own reality type thing. I'm happy yeah, the two just making extremes. my own world. In spite of the fact that Africa is dying, I've got an empire that's about to you know, slaughter a bunch of the world population, nuclear war. In spite of all that, I, I make my own happy reality. That, that's, still, that's where it gets crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to do that either. But that touches on the next point. But that subjectivity is actually the father of invention. Because you invent yeah. things. Well, that's the idea, right? Is, are you really discovering things? Or what are you doing when you shape a hypothesis? And what does that tell you about the, the nature of your mind and the external mind that you're discovering? There's some conjunction. Because yeah. Planck gets at the next point of free will. He says, we may perhaps deal with free will. <coughs> Wait, just before we read that, sorry. He actually makes a fun point with free will. Um, we're gonna read that, because the point that he makes, he says, when you're looking at the at, when you're actually trying to look at the photon, or the electron, and you find yourself pissed off because as soon as you try to look at it, you change it. So you shouldn't be pissed off, because there's other places we see that phenomenon occurring. And he makes the point, 
in a really beautiful argument that the quickest, most direct way we see this phenomenon happening is in our own free will. Right? We have will, we have desires, we have an intention, but as soon as you think about your will, as soon as you think about your intention, do they stay the same? No. The new factors have been introduced, right? We may perhaps deal with free will. Look at subjectively, the will, insofar as it looks to the future, is not causally determined. Because any cognition of the subject's will itself acts causally upon the will. So that any definitive cognition of a fixed causal nexus is out of the question. No fixed determinism. In other words, we might say that looked at from the outside, objectively, the will is causally determined. And that looked at from the inside, subjectively, is free. It's free. Necessity, the necessity of external laws doesn't mean you don't have freedom of the will. That's not a real, that's not a real conclusion you want to draw, but that's been a historical, for thousands of years, that's been the thing, right? If we live in a world of law that has laws, then how can we allow the existence of creative freedom, of spontaneity? How could, that, how could they coexist? Well, right? That's a big problem for a lot of people. That goes back all the way to the Parmenides dialogue with Plato. Then why did the elites allow for the concept of the emergence of order from chaos to arrive? Possibly because they had something to do with its creation. Wow. Possibly because what? They had something to do with its creation. The idea that order organized itself out of chaos. That out of chaos comes of order. Yeah, that right. That without ideas, planned concepts that deal with what, what Plunk is getting at, without that, you can somehow mysteriously have this zeitgeist-like reorganization of utopia, you know, solution coming from just breaking down the, the corrupt system, that it just breaks down. You got that me from the data anarchy moment, right, where everything just goes to anarchy, like just chaos, and then maybe, somehow, a just world order will emerge spontaneously out of that chaos. But there's no determinism implicit in that. It can go in many different directions. The point is it's rational. It, you don't know which direction it's going to go, nor can you know. It's, it's, it's outside of knowledge. So if it's outside kind of knowledge, then how would the elites know which way things would be to steal? They don't. That's why they're out of control. Everything's happening off script right now. So they created a machine without knowing what they could do. That's why they, that's why they, why, that's that's why Hitler like, tried to eat them up. Like, like, think about the Hitler beast, right? The oligarchy created Hitler. Paradox. Hitler tried to destroy the oligarchy. The oligarchy had to fight Hitler. Okay. So that was the same thing. Huh? So not the same thing. Okay, but you keep it on the thing, right? Well, look at ISIS and well, the I'm, elites I'm too. Like, they, 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 they actually crazy. believe their own bullshit. Well, that, they, yeah. they believe, they have <coughs> been yeah, feeding themselves this <coughs> shit for so long. So what you're saying is they're clinically insane. <laughs> yeah. Pretty pretty much. Much. yeah. yeah. Not the pretty pretty much. Much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's there's another disconnect there too. <laughs> Russell is a Russell, right? Russell is, a, is, Russell not, is not a Russell. Russell is not There's a Russell. There's a disconnect. Yeah, yeah. That's a disconnect. That's a huge problem because Russell didn't believe his own bullshit. No. Right? And he the Russellites do. His first work was a fantasy novel just to get across his, his delusional pessimism over the nature of man in the 1880s when he's a young guy. He writes his first fantasy novel describing venomously his hate for people, his hate for scientific progress, and he plays the role of a character that ends up concluding that I have to destroy society. Right? This is a, as a young man just fantasizing, right? Sadly, he goes and puts into the, into practice. <laughs> he did a good but, job. You know, he's, he's like, look, this guy's like eighth generation oligarchy, right? His grand his grandparents were administrators of the oligarchy the oligarchical system, as far as Venice was concerned, of the 15th century. Right? So this, this is a multi generational process of brainwashing your own progeny to carry, to carry out a certain tradition, which is so fucking immoral and unnatural that you have to train the hell out of young people to kill their natural human emotions, which is what they do in Cambridge, <laughs> or All Souls, or Oxford. You don't get your local community college education there. Or if you get a real scholarship, you probably don't want to take that. <laughs> no, their, their children are educated and indoctrinated into that very style of thinking, yeah. into that belief system. Mm -hmm. But this is where it gets kind of beautiful, because now he's saying, well, positively, okay, we know how to develop some, some natural tools to smell what isn't true and, and maybe have a sense of like how do we approach things of the external, the subjective approach to the objective world, but what, what's, what do you do now? Like how do you find a working hypothesis? How do you create a hypothesis, a real good one? 
This is a good working hypothesis. It's essential for any investigation. This being so, we are faced with the difficult question how we are to set about to find the most suitable hypothesis. For this, there can be no general rule. Logical thought by itself does not suffice. Not even where it is an exceptionally large and manifold body of experience to aid. The only possible method consists in immediately gripping the problem or in seizing upon some happy idea. Such an intellectual leap can be executed only by a lively and independent imagination and by a strong creative power, guided by an exact knowledge of the given facts so that it follows the right path. So in other words, he was trying to create the Germanism by enslaving everyone of the children of Max Planck. No, no, no. Oh. Reggie Russell. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because Max Planck is giving you, he's, he's giving you actually his own subjective experience. This is, this is not just some guy writing about the theory of knowledge. How he's actually a guy who's advancing knowledge at this point. Yeah. He's, he's an old man. He's going to die in about seven years after this writing, uh, right after World War II. He's watched his son, you know, he, he, does, he does a sort of sad state. Because, and yet he's still, he's still writing very positive work battling the whole destruction of science, but he's just watched his son uh, executed by Hitler, because his son was part of the, the conspiracy to kill Hitler in 44, and he was executed by the Nazis, so he's, uh, who was a fellow scientist and collaborator of him. Who continues his idea? That's, well, this is the thing. That, this is where things have got somewhat derailed, and there have been sparks of rebirth, but overall, our job is really to try to get it is to do that. Because frankly, here, one, one thing I just want to refer to, this is a really good paper called uh, Classical Music and Scientific Discovery. Two pages, very short, from one of the more recent EIRs. No, 2013, no, not that recent. And uh, it quotes extensively from both Einstein and Planck on their own relationship with their imagination and their discoveries. And uh, Einstein makes the point of saying, my discovery of special relativity, or relativity occurred to me by intuition, and music was the driving force behind that intuition. I am enough of an artist to draw freely upon my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. By that he's defining the Bertrand Russell version of like, logic knowledge. He doesn't mean a broader sense of it. Um, imagination encircles the world. I believe in the brotherhood of man and the uniqueness of the individual. But if you ask me to prove what I believe, I can't. You know them to be true. You could spend a whole lifetime without being able to prove them, like logically, right? The mind can proceed only so far upon what it knows and can prove. There comes a point where the mind takes a leap. Call it intuition or what you will, the mind comes upon a higher plane of knowledge, but can never prove how it got there logically. All great discoveries have involved such a leap. And then he makes a point. Um, I believe that events in nature are controlled by a much stricter and closely binding law than we suspect today. This is still Einstein in a later work. When we speak of one event being the cause of another, our concept here is confined to one happening within one time section. It is dissected from the whole process. Our present rough way of applying the causal principle is quite superficial. That is, you know, like what caused this paper to fall. Will cause linear. that to fall. Huh? Yeah, it's not linear. Well, that's what he's saying. But yeah, because the, the linear way of interpreting what caused this to happen, or what caused the better yet, will cause that tend to fall. Gravity, well, not you. Gravity, right. Yeah. right. So the mechanism of gravity kicked in. Yeah. Because my hand, or we could say, oh, what caused it was my hand opened up that fast. Yeah. Or my, my, my arm moved this fast while it was in motion, right? I could give you any number of infinite choices and say that caused that. Yeah. But that's not what caused it. It was your intention. My intention. Right. So, he says, we are like a child who judges a poem by its rhyme and not by its rhythm. Or we are like a juvenile learner at the piano, just relating one note to that which immediately proceeds or follows. To an extent, this may be all very well when one is dealing with simple compositions, but it will not do for the interpretation of it Bach few. Quantum physics has presented us with a very complex process, and to meet them we must further enlarge and refine our concept of causality. And finally, Max Planck wrote, Science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature, and that is because, in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of nature, and therefore part of the mystery that we are trying to solve. 
Music in art, bar to an extent, also attempts to solve, or at least express, that mystery. But to my mind, the more we progress with either, the more we are brought into harmony with all of nature itself. And that is one of the great services of science to the individual. So this, and there's a picture of Max Planck playing the piano, because Max Planck and Einstein made the point <coughs> that they were at a block, at the blackboard, or at the blackboard, <coughs> and solve. What would they do? They just, Einstein writes profusely about this, he'd go to his violin, he'd play some Beethoven, and he would return back to the problem. Max Planck de describes the same thing. Vernadsky, the great biogeochemist, is on the same path. He's find exact similar quotes by the Ukrainian biogeochemist when he's making his breakthroughs on the newosphere. Same time frame. And this is what LaRouche is saying when LaRouche says, the point is that the true expression of principles of science are actually those of classical artistic composition. And it's when you look at the world, your experience of it, through the ideas of classical tradition, and you see the progress in what is called the classical tradition, which goes to the function of the mind itself. It's the mind itself that is the subject. And it's the ability through the development of the mind that mankind is able to acquire higher orders of language, higher or orders of physical science. Without classical art, that could never have existed. And this is what Kepler is doing with the harmonies of the spheres. The, the work that Planck cites profusely as being core, if anyone's going to understand the real scientific method, he cites Kepler all the time. You're looking at the question of the harmony in the external and the harmony in the eternal, internal world. And how do you form a law based on that conception of man as a creative being and not a being that can be monetized? Or that's just, you know, lives for his vices and virtues, or to maximize his vices and avoid pain. And so we got a big universe to discover. You know, I mean, <laughs> China's going for it, right? They've got a program where they're very ambitious right now in looking at the moon as a serious domain of human exploration and mining of helium-3. They produced 2,000 fusion scientists in our university program. We don't even have fusion. <laughs> and they're producing this many fusion scientists. We don't even have science. We don't even have science. <laughs> we, have, <laughs> we have climatology, which is not a great <laughs> <day. laughs> <laughs> so we, what we've got to do is think about how are, what is the principle that these countries are increasingly tapping into about the nature of man that the oligarchy is afraid of and that Bertrand Russell hated because that is the point that we are going to have to discover and will discover if we're going to make it to the next phase of our evolution. So I just leave it at that. All right. <laughs>
Well, no, I mean, overall, like, this is what Dante, was do Dante Alighieri was doing this when he was coming out with his, and I, I haven't read the whole thing, but from what <laughs> seems to be the case, uh, when, when, when he was developing his, um, his work on language, he knew that there was no unified uh, culture in, in Italy. There were all of these people speaking different dialects that couldn't communicate, so with no national language, you couldn't have a national policy of any sort that would liberate people from their serfdom. So Dante was a big outcast because he fought, he was of the upper strata, but he fought against them, right? As, an, as a politician, as, a, as a, an educational leader, and as a musician, he went and he fought to, to, to create works that would pull out the best, most beautiful qualities of all of the dialects. And he wrote his, his Commedia and his Monarchia and his Linguistica and, and all of these things he wrote to, that redefined the Italian language. And, and certainly, musicality was, was the core aspect of the, the whole investigation. Can I suggest a book? Yeah. It's called How Music Really Works. Mm -hmm. And it describes uh, fundamental principles of how to compose music. It might help you to shape your mind in here. I found it tremendously useful. Mm -hmm. Let your mind just express itself in different ways. Like your mind acting on your mind. Do you remember the author? No, I don't. Uh, it's, called, it's, it's, called, it's called How Music Really Works. How music really works. What was the question? Uh, the, yeah. the question was, well, this is a suggestion. There's a question on uh, what is the role of language in music, and could, does, does language develop by music? And then the gentleman, what's your name? What's your name? Charles. Charles Hack. Uh, just mentioned that there was a quote that you read, read recommend called How Music Really Works. How Music Really Works. Mm -hmm. on just how, 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 how Music How really Music Really Works. works. Yeah. I think we got the URL from Amazon.com. But cer certainly the best way to, to actually study music is to play music yeah. and to sing. And one of the, one of the, the aspects of, the, of what LaRouche set up as part of the, the science curriculum, because our international movement does have a certain science curriculum working through the, the works of Plato, of Kepler, um, which are just a, a necessary component of creating a, a, an intelligentsia in society that could penetrate through the bullshit of what the oligarchy has created as a, a whole layer of fallacies that is our society. Um, but also introduce a policy of, of leadership, right, that we could introduce strategic conceptions and policies that would allow us to break out of the current uh, collapse trajectory. But one of those components is music, and we've got a, a, a serious musical, uh, a lot of music work in a chorus in our full-time movement in Seattle, just a couple of hours away, which Robbie Scott, you know, other people have talked about, well, they go down occasionally with Paul and, and work together with them, and, Increasingly, people want to get a flavor of this thing. You should talk with Paul and see how you can also investigate the science of music by figuring out how you yourself are part of the course and how you harmonize your mind with a, with a whole process to achieve a beautiful result, which is not the case for all music. But when you look at the people who, the, the, the musicians who think like scientists, like Bach, like Beethoven, Schubert, you look at those who have that quality of both balancing freedom and rigorous law together where neither one is sacrificed, but there's a harmony of the two, you can find that in practicing their, their productions that you yourself get more into their mind intuitively. And your intuition, your, your, that, that quality of that's necessary for judging things morally and penetrating more deeply through logic is going to be enhanced in that process if you're doing them both together with an honest intention. Yeah, well, we've been using the word um, chaos as a synonym for disorder, but um, as I understand it, chaos is sort of the order order and order. Yeah. It's a sort of dynamic boundary. Yeah. Uh, and the whole idea is that you can embrace that and you can achieve more. Sometimes you get lost in semantics, frankly. You know, I, I, I don't want us to, to fall off the semantic boat or anything. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. if, sorry, uh, someone in the, in, I'm sorry, the name? Francois. Grant? Francois. Oh, Francois. Francois, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, it brought up poetry and then <clears throat> poetry. I know the Rouge recently, or maybe not so recently, but I know he's talked a lot about poetry as well, in terms of communicating ideas, complex ideas, and, and through the folk music. The, you guys the thing is, is that um, the human being is, is perceptions are actually organ, you know, when you grow up when you're a child, you're, you're, you're creating, you're, you're creating, um, this gets, that's going to go off to the end. But anyhow, um, um, a concept is not something that you can 
communicate literally. That's the problem. And your concept that you have in your mind that you're trying to communicate to another person cannot be communicated literally, but you have to somehow get them to, to, to trigger in them the concept. And when you, when you have literality, like, the, you know, the, the, the way people interpret um, the Bible or the Quran, the Quran's probably a different issue, but the, the, the way people interpret the Bible literally means they're not getting the concept that's, that's being created. And this, but now, um, there's a great poet, one of the greatest English poets, his name is um, uh, Shelley, okay? And he wrote a book called um, In Defense of Poetry. And poetry is not meant to be literal in any way. If you think you know the meaning of the poem, then forget it. It's not in the poem. Uh, <laughs> well, well, just be a description yeah. then. Like, huh? You need to have the gaps to Blake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyhow, but his, his book, In Defense of Poetry, it uh, says that poets are the legislators of, 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 of mankind. They are the true legislators of mankind through, through their poetry. And uh, um, the and and uh, so so that's that's this whole idea of poetry and metaphor is that you're actually using ambiguity and. Um, uh, a paradox to to cause the mind to leap into a concept that is a, that is that that comes into being because you've been posed with a with a with a with a problem that you have to, with a complex uh, problem that you have to now make make the jump you make a jump into a conception and uh, and so. And that's where it's not, that's where people get excited. You know, they have the aha moment, and and that's what makes um, uh, life interesting. But uh, otherwise, it gets very boring. So, but but I see how <laughs> what is a little weird about that too is because you're speaking literally. Oh, of course, it, 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 you find it weird sometimes to find to find yourself needing to speak literally about poetry, which is needed. You, you need to do it, but it's a bit of an irony that you're speaking literally about what good poetry is supposed to be, right? <laughs> Uh, but nonetheless, you, you've got to read poetry and, and do it with an intention to figure out, well, what the hell does the, does Percy Shelley want my mind to do, right? How do I tap into his intention when he's producing this metaphor or this, this, there's something there, right? Yeah, like, you don't just produce, don't, don't pretend because a lot of people suppose it's flowery language. They want to, you know, they want to sound nice, but go beyond that. It, and do the same thing with with um, Machiavelli, right? What what is his intention when he's writing a work like this, or when make, when, he, when he's making a discovery that can be described in this formulaic way? What's the what's the immaterial intention behind the, the symbols? And you do it with music too. So it's just like to listen to some of the stuff, and, and and actually when you read a pick by La Rouge, for example, you're going to find a lot of references to all sorts of things you probably never heard before. But you can go on YouTube and just listen to some of these things. And see, does, is what LeBruce saying about this actually make sense or not? Just do, do an honest investigation. Yeah. You see, the main problem around the world these days is that now China becomes a main player, right? Mm -hmm. how, many, how many people understand China? Very few. None. I even when I was in uh, Russia, when my brother, no, when my son studying in, uh, in high school, I look at the history book, right? Yeah. 550 pages, 55 pages. Yeah. How many pages are devoted to China? 10. How do you know China? Yeah. Now, I can just tell you one thing about just using one word to describe China. Now they're talking about wars, right? The whole civilization is about war. Yeah. War means what in English? What does it mean? Plunder. Plunder. First thing is come to mind. I get that, right? You know what's the Chinese way of defining? War is in the language itself. It's, a, it's a, as you say, a metaphoric gram, a conceptual gram, an ideogram, and a pictogram at the same time. It, but if it, it has two radicals. If you study Chinese, then you know why Chinese don't like war. Mm -hmm. You know why? 
because it started with oneness and defense. Two sub rivals. If you look at it, that means if you were to fight a war, you have to establish oneness. Unite all everybody together. Now, how can you expect the Chinese to make war to plunder? Before thought from the very beginning, if we want to fight a war, is to get everybody together. To harmonize, to create harmony. Yeah. Then, you know, you have to understand China's concept 2,500 years ago. You have this concept to fight for oneness. Mm -hmm. And after fighting oneness, what do you what do you do? If you do the word rule, R U L E rule, it's a concept altogether. That means you. You have to fill up all the fragments together. Before you say like the uh, warring states, they were into seven states, right? After you get them together, the first ever China, you have to fill up all the gaps. That is rule. Rule means not to plug everything. So the whole concept is different. And how many people understand? In fact, I want to go to Harvard University, Cambridge University, and tell them what you mean by China. It's fighting the war. We are ashamed to die outside the country in the very beginning. How do you expect to fight outside? So how, I mean, these things alone, already in our mind since 2,500 years ago. How can you say we are aggressive, we want to rule you? No way. Until this day, we still don't know how to Projection. Okay? Projection, yeah. It's total projection. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> projection. Yeah. Because they can't imagine how somebody else would think yeah. other yeah. than the way they think. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's the problem. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Since you're here and the election is coming up, oof, uh, <laughs> <laughs> can you ask you about the federal election? I mean, the way I see it, NDP is like the best of the three. Um, Look, man, I mean, here's the, you got to be creative about this thing because within the framework of what's being given to you to, to, to <clears throat> vote for, there's no solution to anything, really. And I'm not saying don't vote. I'm just saying you're going to have to introduce another variable in the form of your ability to organize, whether it's uh, officials who want to run for election or whether it's union leaders or whatever, around the policies needed to join BRICS, do less legal, these things that we've been fighting for. And open up, you know, things like the Arctic. Like, what's their view on uh, on accepting Russia's offer and China's offer to build the Bering Strait? You know, most of them don't even most guys who are running for office don't even know that that, that offer is on the table, or joining the AIIB or any of these other things. So, I mean, our job is to take it to that higher level, and there's no voting solution. Simply, but, you know, and, yeah, you're probably going to find a little bit more rationality within the NDP party. You will find that, but don't have any party yeah, party. Uh, the parallel between the U.S. and Canada is that um, the conservatives say they're pro-business, but they're for slavery. The, the, the Democrats say they're for development, but they're both, but they're for green. So each, each of these uh, uh, parties, whether it's the NDP, or the progressive conservatives, or whether it's the Democrats, or the, um, the Republicans, their, self, their policies are internally self-contradicting and self-destructive. And self self-destructive. So how do you craft something out of that that's viable? And in the U.S., that's what, we're, that's what our movement is trying to Craft is viable. How that then plays into the Canadian situation remains to be seen. But it's a similar kind of a paradox where you have the NDP trying to stop austerity, but they're for a different kind of austerity without realizing with the Greens. With the Greens. Yeah. You have the the um, this other group saying they're they're anti-green. They're for development, but they're for, but they're really not for development. They're for going to war with Russia. So it's a very, uh, it's a very, it's a very problematic situation. So how do you come up from the top to intervene in such a way that you cause a a a, a process which uh, moves uh, 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 yields 
a, a, a survivable result. And, and so, in the upcoming elections in Canada, it's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not clear. You know, it's not clear. But, but the voting part is secondary to the, to the conceptual change that has to occur and how do things break up and so forth and so on in, in that respect. Yeah, you got to break people intellectually out of the Bertrand Russell. Under zero, the control, yeah, under thing. the control of, of yeah. and, and if you, like, um, like Franklin Delano Roosevelt took a racist uh, party of the, of, of the, of the, of the worst elements of the United States because the Republicans had been taken over by Wall Street and he turned it into a People's Party when it wasn't a people. The Republican Party was the people, but he transformed it. But that racist element still remained inside the Repub the Democratic Party. See, so so this is you know, this is what you this is so you have a situation in Canada which is different because Canada is a much different is got a different structure and and, you know, we won't go into that at this point, but the point is that um, um, we're, I, don't see, I, I don't see our movement getting behind a particular party at this, you know, at this point, because, you know, you know, it's, I don't know, I don't know what good that's going to do, you know, and, and if it's going to do anything. It's got a new one. Huh? It's got a new party. That's a, it's got to be an outlook, but it is not, yeah, that's got to be an objective that we hold in our minds. Uh, but do we have enough time to? Well, here's the thing, right? It doesn't. Are we so close? Well, this is this is why it, it, the typical conventional uh, political structures in which people expect a change to happen is not the way things are going to be yeah. happening now. Yeah. Uh, there, things are happening completely off off of the typical script. And yeah, we're we're not on the script now on yeah. the global scale. There's not there's no script right now. The control is gone. Whatever comes out of this process comes out of this process. It's not it's not. Uh, predetermined at this point. It really, the emergence of the bricks <laughs> well, and everything else is happening is not <laughs> scripted at this point. Certain things are though, are they not? Like certain things, like as far as the, um, like the Greek. No, that's not scripted either mm -hmm. at this point. That's why everybody's freaking out. Everything is, is up for grabs. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not control. They're not in control. But then, no, then we're not in control either. So um, you're 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 in a global dual power situation. I'm using uh, old old terms from the old days, the good old days. <laughs> you're in a global dual power situation now, merging two uh, systems between two different systems. Yeah. We're going to see a lot of things that we haven't seen before. Yeah, you're going to see you're going to see completely different different things. You can never imagine what's going to come next. Yeah, and we don't. Well, we, we know what we would like to see happen. We know what direction it should go in. And, and we, we have to communicate the conceptions that, uh, the, the, the conception, we have to communicate those conceptions to the proper, to the proper, you know, to the population, but more, more also to the, to the, to the people who are, who are going to have to make, uh, uh, Oh, actually, yeah. And that, that's where the, the obligation uh, gets a bit. This is the, the challenge that we should all feel to say, well, can I properly represent and wield these conceptions in such a way that I can do that? Can I put myself in front of a grouping of, uh, of diplomats or a grouping of elected officials and actually speak in, a, in, a, in such a way that I can, well, will I have something to say to them, first of all? Right? Will I know what the hell to say to them and to develop them? Or do I, am I not there yet? And if I'm not there, how, how do I have to figure out pathways to get to that place where I can do those things that I can't with my current capacities? So it's, it, it requires some investment here, but we, again, time's not on, on our side either. You know? So just to tie this back to Rob's question, specifically regarding Canada, would you say in the absence of new parties, you know, hopefully temporary absence of new parties, to hopefully go in a more correct direction, would be... <coughs> Uh, if, okay. if somebody was to, to vote, would you basically just okay. vote for someone who has more of a potential to, to go the right way, which I guess in the, at the moment is being seen as the NDP in Canada, if that would personally agree with the majority of what they're espousing? Okay, you don't know that until just on the eve of the 
you won't know, and you have to make that choice on your own. Uh, but the, the situation in Canada, the laws governing the creation of political parties have provisions in them that, that compromise, your, that, that make you vulnerable. To, in term, to, to, to operations that could be run against you, against your party from the inside and the outside and everything else like that. The legal structure of forming a political party in Canada is such that it creates openings for external interventions <coughs> and disruptions and, and, and can set you up legally for criminal prosecution if they want to. And it, it, it's a very... It's very, it's, it's a very, uh, we looked into the, the whole process of, 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 of creating a political party. It, it's not, it's not, you're not really free. You are bounded by certain laws and financial uh, reporting laws and, and you essentially have a, a elements of, that are not in your party have direct uh, uh, capabilities to disrupt your legally disrupt your 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 your. your, your well, I, I think without getting yes. Yeah, I don't want to give no details. But the Canadian the like, Canadian situation is very unique. That's all I gotta say. Can you remember a, a source where we can go in and check out some of these things? Look up how you form a political party. Yeah. Well, uh, but that's not. I'm not yeah, saying you should do that. To get conceptual here. Um, but that, we, we do know that in the future, yeah, the, the question is the future, right? Because this is what's, um, it exists, it's pulling us in the future, it's pulling us, like everything that's happening now is happening because of uh, certain future conditions, but it's underdetermined. It, it's susceptible to intervention, to change. Yeah. Um, you see, if, if we got, again, this plays into the part of the wave thing, right? Yeah. If they, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a very good lesson in, in, in a sense to recognize that unlike the particle, or the, the, light, the light photon, we can choose our behavior in relation to the wave and amplify it in a way that our will and our judgment defines as being necessary based on the future where that wave is going. Now we know that the banking collapse and the type, the structure of the derivatives web internationally has totally penetrated the Canadian credit unions, the banking system, we know that. We're one of the few people who do know that. We also have certain abilities to, to evaluate the physical uh, destruction, physical economic destruction that we've subjected ourselves to for 40 plus years. We know those things too. We also have certain insights into nuclear, like nuclear policy, uh, fusion policy. Afterwards, we have all sorts of of capabilities that are very makes us very rare, unique, important, and scary to the oligarchy because we have those, and we can teach them. So and that's our, our, about that. our approach is the field of ideas, yeah. and creating an environment where people who come in here can take those ideas out to others who are also part of the field of ideas. And, and through that process, we intersect the other process which is going on, which is that um, the Canadian situation is governed by people, by, by people or who, who, are, who are involved in the discussions behind the scenes that you don't see. But those discussions behind the scenes are the, are the substance of what's going on because the, the Canadian political system is opaque. It's not, it's not transparent in any way. Yeah. And therefore, in a situation where there's no discussion in the population, and there's no discussion, open discussion, we create an open discussion. We create an open discussion so that, so that there is an access to a process that is not that otherwise is closed. And that, that, if we can do that to any degree, it's, it has a huge impact, but it's not, it's, not, it's not visible, it's not a visible impact, except, in, except that somehow somebody comes forward with those ideas and you say, well, those were the ideas that we were generating. But you did generate them, but they, you know, I see this in many parts of the world where ideas that I've been We've been beating these people over the head for 30 years, and all of a sudden they come forward with these ideas that we've been beating them over the head for 30 years with. So, <laughs> you know, so I mean, there's that aspect, that's what I'm saying, there's that, that aspect. 
There's that aspect of it. So you're not, so it's the field of ideas, the field of discussion. You don't really affect things so much on a one-on-one, -on -one, but you affect things through a field, through a process of, of, of discussion. And then this also intersects the blogosphere. This also intersects, intersects the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the discussion process. Because there is no, there is no, where there is no discussion, there is, you know, it's only where there's discussion that you have, um, it's, it's what you introduce into the discussion, the, the dialogue that is the key to, to the political process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, whatever the Canadian situation is, something is very obvious, I think I'm repeating okay. what's obvious now, is that the conservatives have to vote. Right. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So that's 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 a starting point. Mm -hmm. And whatever that now we have to think, look at them and see what's going okay. on. Okay. But uh, I don't think the. No, I, I don't think there's a viability. I think. Yeah, that's I think, not. Yeah, voting conservative is not an option. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> yes. Yeah. Let's take that out. But of I don't want to take an yeah. official position at this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't want to. 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 I any recommendations officially, okay? I want to add one comment to that. Yeah. That, um, that the research, for example, that Matt has done in the, the, the creation of BC Hydro, for example, uh, is illustrative of the nature of um, Canada was changed by the WAC Bennett creating Hydro. Not only in BC, become a modern, more modern nation, a more modern economy, but in Quebec. And this was done against the imperialist forces in Ottawa. Now, this is the way Canada is kind of set up as a confederalist uh, confederation. And I think this is the way that change is going to come in Canada again. And what so, you mean is the provinces versus federal. Right. Well, it, at this point, I, I would say in my investigations that in the context of the world that we had in that transition period in the 60s, I would say that that was the necessary path that it had to take um, based on the fact that the technocratic system hadn't ingrained itself in Quebec for 40 years yet. That, that only happened afterwards. And there was a certain, again, the context defines certain things that are appropriate, you know, Right. Uh, though truths and principles exist for all time. Um, I think today, with the type of speedy change that the BRICS system is forcing upon the oligarchy in the world as a whole, I don't think it'll be a, that type, it won't take that form at this point of provinces going off, doing their own thing, because there's been 40 years to sort of set certain institutions of control in place since then. Not to say you shouldn't think about that at all, but I'm saying that that's not going to be the form it takes, I don't think, based on my research now. I think, if anything, what you have with Kretzian showing up in Moscow immediately with Putin, uh, Jean Kretzian. Right, to, oh, oh, right, 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 right. Four weeks ago. Four, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, at the height of the tension of, of the nuclear war, things like that are indicative of establishment decisions being made in the back rooms about what Canada's role is going to be. And in the context of the BRICS process increasingly becoming hegemonic, I think in that we can recognize that potentials here will open up to actually establish firm footings, to actually start acting like a real independent country. But that, that we don't have the culture for it on the one hand. If you think about like what, there's this guy, uh, Lazare Carnot of France, who said, you know, it's better to have Republicans without a Republic than a Republic without Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that, that's... Better to have what? Better to have Republicans with no Republic than a Republic with no Republicans. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So it says, like, how do you create that that condition? It's a cultural. It's a, it, it, you have to give people a mission to start building something, develop a certain sense of skills, of, of a certain sense of usefulness, and the type of morality that naturally springs up when you start thinking about the future. And you start recognizing that you're part of a whole, that you know, you're a useful part of a whole, not just somebody working in marketing. Bam. Then you can start taking on deeper ideas that are necessary for a Republican self-governing society to flourish, which sadly, we're just not there yet, you know? I mean, we've got to heal that cultural wound. And the science discussion, the music discussion, I think, is a really wonderful planks that we can bring to bear 
to give people a new variable, a new, a new, a new governing principle in their minds about what they're capable of doing, that they never thought they would be capable of doing before. Yeah? Well, I don't know. Bad news. And they start pulling up their charts, and they start making an excuse, or making arguments, very mathematical, logical arguments, that Africa is doing really great. Its business is up, the markets are up, they're, you know, and they're, they're, if you would just look at the map, you'd think, well, there must be a, a renaissance. Things are so monetarily good based on the data sets that they're presenting. And, um, and it got me thinking in, in a discussion with them afterwards, you know, we were playing with this irony that in our society, we pride, our, pride ourselves in the West of having produced more PhDs per capita than in any other moment in our, in our past. And yet, with all of those PhDs being pumped out of our society, out of our universities, the collapse of our civilization is happening at a faster and faster rate. Paradox. If the purpose of education is supposed to equip people with the mental capacities to solve problems, why the hell are we only making problems worse and worse? And it seems good people, who seem to be, you know, they kiss their child uh, bed at night, they're reading stories, they're a good neighbor, good father, good mother, yet these people, as soon as they become PhDs and work for the World Bank, work as economists in most of the institutions, they seem to have a complete disconnect that the theories, the ivory tower formulas that they apply, kill millions, if not billions of people. There's a total disconnect between the theory, this abstract system of formula, and reality. There is generally not a very good connection. How is that the case? What are we doing wrong? And this is where the question of Bertrand Russell becomes very interesting from another angle. Because yes, as, I, as Paul, as you recapitulated, mutually assured destruction, society of fear, <coughs> divide to conquer, a balance of powers, that's been the last 60, 70 years, right? A total balance of terror from the Soviets, from the, the Americans, the capitalists, the you know, you, you had the, um, what should Africa do to stop being so bad, right? And you go to this thing and there, there, there's certainly a few African diplomats there, but generally the whole thing is controlled by a bunch of detached white bureaucrats. <laughs> Talking as experts about what Africa should do to be more behaved. Ask me, I will let you know because soon I'm going to run for president. Let that okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the, here's the thing. What they started doing is they started pulling up a bunch of statistical graphs and stats and index charts, pointing out. The first, they had a, a corruption index chart of the world going through all of the most corrupt na nations. Of course, you know, Africa, all the, Russia, China, very corrupt on the index chart of corruption. Uh, Canada, number one, not corrupt, 100% no corruption, right? Great Britain, no corruption. <laughs> and of course, they're, they're giving this, these charts as a way to somehow just, they're mathematical, entirely mathematical, right? As if you could measure corruption or inequality by a mathematical metric, as if that were possible, but they do it anyway. And then they use that as a way to morally say, this is why we can tell them how much carbon they have to reduce, how much they have to obey to international standards of good governance. Now, I don't know if they've ever looked at what exactly Harper does in the, in the back rooms or what the Privy Council is in Canada, but I think that would change their charts a little bit. Um, one of the, one of the uh, a professor gets up afterwards who's from Nigeria, and he begins his presentation by, by saying, I'm going to be declaring war on mathematics. <laughs> He's not saying he is mathematics. He's saying he gives an anecdote of one of his uh, uh, invitations to participate in a World Bank summit meeting. A World Bank meeting on African culture. He was supposed to be a representative to speak as an authority on African culture. And he said, as, as soon as I got there, I saw a bunch of IMF, World Bank economists, um, <laughs> um, all sitting together talking about Africa. And he was, and you, you're wise enough to know, know your material, but you have the creative spirit enough to think outside the box. You can discover the laws of the universe and translate that back in ways that are both beautiful, that have expression in arts have expression in science, and that's the technological improvement that allows us to have 7 million people on Earth. And the oligarchy has been doing a lot of propaganda as we went through to get people to believe that the fact that we have 7 billion people on the Earth that can live much longer than we could have 3,000, 4,000 years ago in general, that's a sign that we're a virus. Most people would say, oh yeah, of course we're 7 billion people on the Earth. That's a sign that we're a virus. Don't you know that? No. What, th what they're missing is that there's a that is a shadow of a principle. The principle is not something you can see because that is the driver of what defines us as a human and not a monkey. Physically, we're not that different. The DNA-wise is not that different. If you're going to try to make a materialist case for why we're different than animals, you won't go very far. Right? We've got a bigger prefrontal cortex. We can lie better. 
<laughs> we play better video games because we have yeah. multiple dunks. <laughs> but if you, if you get beyond that to a deeper species characteristic that we are able to, to discover how we think and think better about th after having discovered that one assumption that we had was wrong and replace it with a better hypothesis that allows us to resolve paradoxes and translate that back to doing good for ourselves and our fellow man and find happiness in that process. If you can define human beings as that, the oligarchy, no oligarchy, whether it's Asian or European or whatever its, its flavor, will ever be able to sink its, its tentacles into human society. And the fact that Paul brought up the question of culture, and, and well, he brought up the, 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 this very important personality who you guys all have some, some disgusting literature in front of you named Bertrand Russell. And I'm assuming before people got here, did they already have an idea of who Bertrand Russell was? So, so? Yeah? Okay. Mr. LaRouche, uh, the gentleman we worked with, uh, was a 93-year-old physical economist, uh, a candidate for the presidency of the American uh, Republic on eight occasions, and an advisor to international governments, has made the point on a number of occasions, which people find very troubling, that Bertrand Russell is the most he qualifies as being the most evil man of the 20th century, which is controversial, because as Paul went through, this is, the, this is the big peacemaker. He, he won the Nobel Prize for literature. He's, uh, he's the guy who fought the, throughout the 60s to create the anti-nuclear movement, right? To, to ban the bomb and all of these things. <coughs> so how the hell is a guy who's apparently a logician? For literature, they wrote a book. It Love. was a special book for the entire activity. I'll get back to you on that one. Um, he did write prolif prolifically. But Bertrand Russell's ghost doesn't just infest our society in the form of a fear of, of thermonuclear annihilation, being it that he was one of the co-architects of the mutually assured destruction doctrine. It goes deeper than that as well. That's one important aspect. And I'm going to touch in my presentation on, on another aspect. And I'm going to do it in a way that uh, utilizes the writings of a certain scientist and a philosopher and a musician named Max Planck. Um, before I do that, though, I, I want to start with a quick anecdote because, and this, this is going to get at how the ghost of Bertrand Russell's mind still infects and controls and distorts our society today. We, Christine and myself were at a little while ago at a, a conference uh, called Africa 2063. It's one of these conferences in Ottawa held by uh, the public service, or you know, some the government of Canada. Formulas that tell you you have to think this way and you can't break out of those formulas. If you don't believe that, 